So, um, good evening. We'll start the Norton School Committee May 7th, 6.30 meeting. Um, the first thing on the agenda is the warrants. All right, this is a, a long list here. Um, I have reviewed and approved the following warrants. February 6, 2020, $872,789.70. February 20th, 2020, $455,065.05. February 27th, 2020, $241,786.97. March 4th, 2020, $110,568.39. March 18th, 2020, $567,865.61. April 16th, 2020, $400, $403,060.37. April 23rd, 2020, $159,839.61 and April 30th, 2020, $380,674.65. I wish to enter them into public record. <laughs> okay, thank you, Sherry. Um, student representatives, Carolyn, I see you. Do you want to start? Um, sure. Well, the most exciting thing that's happened, um, at least for the seniors so far, was we just had our signs dropped off the other day. It was so great. Um, that was such a nice surprise and getting to see some faces. I, I saw Mrs. Mahoney. She was the one who dropped it off for me, as you probably saw on Twitter, unfortunately. Um, and it was just really great to see some familiar faces and have that little bit of excitement. Dr. Kiefer dropped off mine. He's been growing up the beard. I love to see him. <laughs> uh, it was just super nice. Uh, it was really nice that they're doing that all around Norton and for all the kids. I think it's really important to thank the uh, Norton High School Parent Board, which was really the group that led it. And then um, a number of organizations connected to the high school, including the Norton Teachers Association, uh, became uh, active uh, donors. So um, that's all paid through donations and people working really hard. Um, and then a bunch of teachers and supporters going out and making sure that you guys got, got those. So really, really, um, it was really cool to see all the pictures. And I did see both of you, by the way, um, to just, uh, you know, get some positive feel. Cause I know this has been such a, 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 a difficult time. It's just a different time. So, uh, more coming. I hear there's some more stuff coming. So we'll, we'll keep on, uh, we'll keep on uh, trying to do some crazy things. <laughs> Uh, do you guys have anything else to add? Uh, not really. I mean, AP exams are next week, so and the week after, so you know that'll be fun and different. It'll yes. be nice. only spending forty-five minutes per exam instead of three hours. <laughs> we, should, we should probably do a, a senior snow day. Oh yeah, definitely. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I my niece T-shirt that it says. Um, that they are the senior skip champions of the world, 2020. Mm. Oh, seriously. Oh, yeah. We rocked this year's senior skip day. It's been 60 days of senior skip days by the time this is all done. <laughs> all right, so moving on, um, does anybody have any questions for them or? Um, so moving on, we have the FY20 financial update. So uh, this month's update is uh, a little different from what we've done in the past because uh, now we're focusing on uh, cost avoidance due to the COVID-19 issue. Um, we have on the sheet, there's three columns. Uh, the first column is a traditional is the 4156, uh, MGL 4156 doesn't allow us to make payments for, until services are rendered or materials are received. So that column is basically where we're at right now. We're not making payments to Bloom or to Vanpool uh, and those are our two big savings right now that we're looking at. Uh, we gave you column B and C because we do have a couple of groups that are working to negotiate with Bloom and with uh, Vanpool to uh, come down to a percentage that they would recommend. I think Bico just voted today uh, to support 78%, which we just can't support that. It, it's, it doesn't make any voted, sense. Uh, just so, so that the committee knows, uh, Matt, I voted no on that 78% and made an argument against it. And I was joined by Easton, Uxbridge, and Blackstone Millville, but we lost the vote. Oh, the 78% is a hold harmless, and, and we're not in a, a position to do that. It's just they're, they're private businesses. They have to 
anticipate that there might be some hiccups in our business. And then for us to cover them completely, we just can't do it. So we're, uh, in their savings, we're kind of focusing on column A, which is uh, the 4156 uh, cents. So right now, uh, as it is right now, we're looking at about $400,000 savings. Uh, the bottom line on the budget right now is uh, overspent by 41,000. We have a lot of purchase orders that we have to clear yet. So this is just netting out to about an anticipated $374,000 in savings. Um, we have some revolving fund support that we have to do. The facility rental uh, revolving fund with Champions not operating, we no longer have that revenue coming in. So there are expenses that um, there are some salaries that we would pay on the facility rental line that we have to move to appropriations to support those. And there are going to be some other expenses that come in that are going to have to transfer over as well as they occur. Um, so we will have probably some more money right now. It's about $67,000 we're projecting that we'll have to support with appropriation funds. Could be a little bit more. We just don't know what those unanticipated repairs might be. Um, and the money is just not there because we're not taking the revenue. Um, I have a projected fee re um, uh, refunds uh, for fee reductions. Uh, we'll cover that in the next bullet item. That's about $64,000. So for the revolving right now, we're looking at about 131,000 we have to, to support, but net of the savings that we're looking at from the, the transportation, we're looking at about a savings of $240,000. So added to that, um, thank you, Matt. Um, the biggest issue that we have on my no vote with Vanpool through BICO um, is what, what, how is that binding to Norton Public Schools, number one. And number two, um, if I'm not paying that, um, you know, at 78%, um, then, um, you know, how do I provide transportation? So I've already asked uh, Matt um, to start working on that process, um, the potential that for July 1st, I'll be with a different vendor, um, regardless if we're, uh, well, I shouldn't say regardless if we're buying down that contract or not. The other part that is important for you folks to know is that there has been a bill filed. Hey, Joe, to, can I ask Heck, that's a quick question on this for clarity. Yeah. yeah. When you um when you're saying you're unsure of the BICO vote and, and how it affects us, you're talking about just BICO transportation, right? That is correct. Okay. That is correct. Okay. It's a, the the contract was 13 communities, of which 11 are BICO. So it went through BICO as a way to try to coordinate right. and pay and all that stuff. So um, so would we we wouldn't really have any recourse to to step out of that right i mean it's that's what i'm looking at now is what is our recourse for walking away from that so considering that the services under chapter uh, 4156 are not chapter 41 section 56 are not being rendered to us now to answer that part of the question there's a bill that's been filed on behalf of vendors to allow for negotiations if you will to take place and to then pay something in this particular case Bampool through BICO negotiated at 78% based on 3% savings on fuel, which I think is incredibly low, 4% on um, rental, uh, on repair and maintenance, which I think is incredibly low, and 15% based on um, their uh, uh, tax process through employment for a total of 22% reduction. The idea is that their company has grown so much and has so many more employees than that 500. Uh, uh, cap that the feds put on. So the question that I have is if I'm not getting a service, I don't have to pay a vendor. If the law changes the way that the law is currently written, unless it's changed in the, in the legislative process is that it's a local decision. Um, typically town accountants would not agree to pay a vendor, a third party, if you're not getting the service. For whatever reason, we already have towns and municipalities that I guess those town accountants are looking the other way because they're coming to agreements. We just haven't come to any agreement. And to be quite honest, um, the concern is um, the concern is that you know we're not going to have the drivers, we're not going to have this, we're going to have that. And I think you all know my feelings about transportation. Um, I can't utilize certain terms that I would like to. Not not bad words or anything, but terms in terms of, you know, we, we, we get four bids, they come in and pick them up and then you only get one actual bid. Something's mm -hmm. going on with transportation in the Commonwealth. And now for me to say, let me give you, let me give you, you know, X numbers, you know, half a million dollars worth of, of, of you doing nothing. I, I, I just has a bad taste in my mouth. Yeah. I'm, 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 
I get that and I'm, I'm with you on it. Um, my, my concern, well, I have a couple of different concerns on it. Uh, my, my first is, are we sure we want to kind of die on that hill and say, you know, hey, Bico, we're gonna, we're not gonna pay the 78% and, and we're kind of stepping out of our, our agreement with you guys. My second concern is if, if we don't pay it, is are, are we basically pushing that cost to the other Bico collaborative members? Yeah, and that's what I want to look into because the impact that that has on not being able to save money has a direct impact on potential cuts that I have to make. Right. Yeah. So it's, um, it's, a weird, it's a weird situation. It is. It is. Yeah. I'm not going to put the I'm not going to put the district in a situation where we don't have the ability to transport students that are needed to be transported by law. I, I'm just suggesting that the idea of 78 cents on the dollar just <clears throat> just is, is is way too high, way too high for a for profit company. Right. So with these negotiations that they were doing, what, what they're trying to do is they're trying to put together a memorandum of agreement with these companies, essentially what it is is sort of a temporary contract while this contract can't do anything. Um, and the idea is that once the, the crisis is over, the, the MOU or MOA would, would uh, negate itself and you would go back to the original contract. So it, it's, it, it's, it kind of depends on that, um, being able to write this contract. So. We'll still have a contract in place with Vample. We'll still have a contract in place with Bloom, um, whether we agree to the memorandum of understanding or not. The second part that goes with that, that's um, part of, of trying to figure this all out, is the, the concern that I have is that these folks are not our direct employees. You know, they work for a third party. It's not like we're doing with our uh, bus drivers that we have that work for us. Um, and then the, uh, the argument that I have a problem with is that they're available to us. So I, I guess what I should do is call Vanpool tomorrow and tell you, I'd like for you to just drive by every kid's house that you pick up and wave. And at least I'll, at least I'll feel like they're doing something. Have we found out, um, I only heard on the Massachusetts um, School Committee one, there was something about a Chapter 46, um, and it yes. involved some PP. Are we sure that they're not getting paid through that already? Well, because of the size of the company. So what's happened is Vanpool has grown tremendously, and then they bought out another company with over 1,000 employees. So they're well over, I don't want to lie, but at least two to 3,000 employees. Over 3,500 um, at this point. Okay. So... So uh, they don't currently fall. However, we did put language, they did put language in there that says that if they were in fact to file for any of that and receive it, then, then we, we received a refund um, off of that. And also we're not the only ones that are only getting one bid. Um, they're actually trying to put together some kind of um, legislature to look into the fact that school <laughs> systems are only getting one bus bid, which is yeah. something's wrong um, with that. I was on the school committee in my hometown from uh, 1998 to 2004, and we were talking about this. <laughs> you know, it's it's. Uh, I get it, I really do, but it's it's too much of a. Uh, I hate to say this negatively, but because I, I think local mom and pop shops are the way that make a wonderful community, but that's what transportation has become. Any other that's questions it. on financials? Moving on, um, discussion of refunding fees. All right, so the next uh, sheet that I do have, we've got four um, fee-based items on the, on the list. Um, so I'll just go down uh, the first and right down to the bottom. So clubs and activities, we're still doing those through distance learning. Um, so at this time, when we look at these, we, we're not recommending for clubs and activities that we do any kind of a refund. Um, they can just continue to do it through the distance learning and everyone can Remote learning. Uh, remote learning. Uh, Matt, can I interrupt you for a minute because sure. um, I think some of them at the middle school aren't doing remote. So it just might be something that you might want to consider. Um, Drama Club, for example, I think that's sort of finished. Um, I think it just sort of barely had started and unfortunately it finished. That's just one. I'm not sure if the other clubs just being a, a middle school parent and kind of hearing from other families that they're doing remote. So yeah, I, I, think I think like the full year clubs might be a little different, but some right. of the clubs that just started in the spring, it just might be something to consider. Okay. Okay. Um, 
So athletics, we we did we refunded um, everyone who paid a spring uh, a user fee. No spring season. Uh, there's no sense in holding that money. It's a lot like the field trips where um, we didn't do anything, so we're just we were refunding that money, and and we got that uh, process. Um, we do anticipate um, some expenses that are going to have to be supported by the budget um, because we don't have the revenues coming in. So we we have uh, sort of a cycle where we take some of our in the spring we do some pre-purchasing for our fall, in the fall we do pre-purchasing for the winter, uh, and it cycles around. So we we have some pre-purchases that we do have to make for the fall sports, um, and we have some bills that are coming in that um, that we just have to pay small bills, prorated bills. So we do anticipate about forty two thousand dollars expenses that have to be supported by appropriations um with the coaches we have we, we don't have spring sports we don't have spring coaching commitments, so we have a savings there so where the the appropriated budget for athletics will should support any of the expenses that are coming back in from the revolving fund um little lances and when we look at the um pay Paying 11, not paying 16, pending is 13, 85, so these are negotiating. Can you highlight that here? Or, or are they not? Oh, I'm sorry. This is, yeah. So on this column, that is um, on the listserv. We have, there's a whole number of surveys that are going around. Listserv is like the business manager's listserv where we all kind of communicate. These surveys get thrown out there and people answer. Uh, so these school districts, um, 11 school districts answered that they're paying somewhere between 10 and 50%. Some of them are just paying their head coaches. Um, we have 16 school districts that said they're not paying. Um, and then there are 13 that are still in a pending status. Um, and a lot of those, 85% of those are, are negotiating with their yes. union on. With Wait, their so so I'm, I'm, I guess I'm asking you more, more so, what are they negotiating? What's, what's the, 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 so the positions were filled per contract, regardless if they're um, a teacher or somebody from the outside. So what we've done is worked at how much work was done preseason, meaning the two, the two weeks before the season, and should they be compensated for that based on a 10-week system. Everybody's doing it differently. We've put a number on the table with them um, in terms of resolving that issue, uh, in, in terms of a percentage. Um, it's nowhere near some of the numbers you just heard um, versus um, some districts that are paying full uh, because it's defined as a you know year-round type of thing. Uh, our contract is very clear that it's seasonal and they were appointed for the season. Um, so they did attend, for example, preseason meetings, AD meetings, uh, student athlete meetings, um, and all of that stuff. So what does that, as a total, what does that look like in a quote, 10 season non-playoff, not counting tournaments and playoffs, just looking at the season which is typically two weeks before and eight weeks of practice and play. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and of course that will come to you for approval so that you know, because that, that would require that you guys review it and approve it because it does change the contract and has a money attachment to it. Uh, next one is the, uh, the Little Lances program. Um, there's a mix again of, um, we are doing some, just we're doing distance learning with that. Um, the distance learning started out really well for that age group. And what we're hearing from Anne-Marie Baker is that it's, it's going downhill. Um, the attention span is just not there. The, the, the maturity to be able to, to handle the online learning, uh, the remote learning is just not, they're not handling it well. And they're starting to have a lot of breakdowns and participation is starting to drop off. So we have a, a two different recommendations on this based upon what we had seen from the listserv survey. We have a hundred percent refund. Uh, which would be $16,000 of actual checks we would have to write back to people who paid in full for the year. Uh, we have other people that pay monthly, so they would just be not paying their, making their payments. Um, and that would have about $40,000 that would have to be supported by appropriations. Um, the other option is to do a 50% refund since we're doing the, the, uh, the, the distance learning. Um, that's about an $8,000 worth of checks we'd have to write out to people. And again, there's, there's folks that just wouldn't pay their bills that we're paying monthly. And that's about $30,000 that would have to come by appropriation. So just to piggyback on Matt's comments, just as a reminder, we have a preschool program which is required by statute. And then we have our peer students, if you will, uh, uh, that are part of the classrooms. Um, and those are the people that actually pay uh, into. So the breakdown, uh, you know, Anne-Marie wrote a really 
detailed email to Matt and CCB on it. It's it's pretty significant the drop out by the drop off and and the you know parents physically having to take their students and putting them in front of a screen and you know so we've gone from oh hi it's the teacher and this is so much fun to oh no this is not what I want to do right now and and of course with students who um, uh, have um, may have um, uh, learning challenges it becomes even more of a significant significant issue and, and any of those any of us who have been or our parents of kids we remember when they were three years old and four years old and putting them in front of a screen is not necessarily you know they do it when they want to not when they're old to basically I hate to say it that way but um, I think we really need to take a look at um, probably April May and June some combination of a three-month um, refund and uh, again we're not voting on this tonight we're going to vote on it next week just in case you guys wanted to have other ideas to look at um, but it's just important for us uh, to really take a look at take a look at uh, being fair. What would, be, what would like the seventy five percent, for instance, be like? How much of an impact would that? Like, I always kind of looked at the whole yeah, thing back away fairly. Yeah, we lost you. We lost yeah. you. All right, try it now. What about like a seventy five percent? We'll run those numbers for you too. Yeah, you can add that. I can only imagine how hard it is for the parents. I mean, that they're not the type of, they're not the age that you could put in front of something and say, okay, go through this and I'll be back in a couple minutes. So, I mean, they have to sit with them the entire time and they have their, you know, unfortunately so many people are working from home. I, I just don't even know how you would do that. Yeah. So we'll, we'll come back with, uh, we have a 50, we'll add the 75 and we have a 100 and you'll see the financials and also what you think is the, the best resolution to this. Joe, can I just say one important thing sure. is that um, even within this, it's still important to note that for the students with disabilities, we still have to find a way to provide services. So we're not just going to say that we're ending the preschool program completely. Correct. And does that mean if we give any kind of refund back, the students that were still kind of logging on and, and doing work, will there be I, anything left for them or will it be uh, all? Uh, I would suggest that they have the opportunity to still come into that to that class setting. I, 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 I mean, with everything that's going on in the world, if it's if you have those one or two kids where it's being successful, I don't, I don't think we should change anything right now. Yep. It's just the it's the idea that people are paying directly for a service that right now is becoming a significant issue for families. And again, if it's being successful. Um, you know, we, we don't necessarily want to say, well, stop coming into the meeting. We still, like Jean said, we still have to provide services. So we might as well provide to all. No, no student is getting their equal access right now, period. Yeah. Um, so then uh, the, the last one is transportation. Uh, we did not transport for three months. Uh, so we would recommend a, 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 a prorated refund for those three months. Which is approximately about fifty thousand dollars that would have to be supported by appropriations. Pretty cut and dry on that one. Yeah, I'll tell you right now. You can you can take my refund and put it to the meal program or to ITAC for the meal program or whatever. Yeah. Well, that's one of the options for us to consider. Is that if we send people, you know, we could take a step and say, would you, you know, do we do a direct refund? Um, do we allow for a donation? and they would have to put it to us in writing like you just said or um is there the potential that some people and i hate to say this out loud but some people want us to keep the money for next year and offset their actual bill for next year so if it's 350 and we're giving them 100 back they only owe us 250 for some for some families that might be best but for some of our families they are getting hit with a transportation fee a little lancer fee and potentially even an athletic fee that they just got back not including all the other stuff that we the heck out of and, and we can process any either of those three ways where we're set up we can send the checks we can definitely do the credit we talked about that today and found that we do have a process for that um and certainly we always accept money <laughs> yeah, I, I think we should definitely include the option to to donate it uh, I, i'd like to have that option So um, Holly was on one of our uh, staff members and asking about providing opportunities for the students. And I think we answered that by saying, yes, that we're not taking away the opportunity 
even if the, the committee next week votes to give people back 100% refund on that uh, on the a little answers. Um, so thank you to uh, Ms. Holly for uh, for asking that question. We want to be clear that whatever financial decision is made by the school committee, that the recommendation would include that services still be provided, regardless if they're mandated services or optional services. Yeah, and those support numbers for the appropriations do include continuing to have staff working. So the goal here is for you guys to kind of sit on it. If you have more questions for Matt, I would just ask you, to, uh, we're gonna move on this as a vote next week on each of these. And so if, if you have some thoughts or ideas, just contact Matt directly, um, hopefully by Monday, no later, so that he can run some numbers or whatever you, you wanna, wanna see as part of the discussion next week. Okay, um, does anybody have anything else? All right, moving on, um, the next phase of remote learning. Mrs. O'Neill. Um, so I provided you with a brief update of what remote learning has looked like since we left school on March 13th. Um, the way that the commissioner has described remote learning is that we've looked at it over, you know, we're in the third phase, or we're going to be entering the third phase. Phase one was simply uh, making sure that students and families um, were safe and they were, they were healthy and that they had access um, to you know, things such as, for example, um, our, school, our school lunch program, um, making sure that they had some sort of a little bit of academic enrichment during that time, um, which were all things that we did right out of the gate. Um, our students in K-3 I'm sorry, K-2 were sent home with learning packets on that last Friday. We also sent home um, the devices with all of our students in grades three to 12 on that last day, knowing that um, at that time, we thought we were only going to be out for two weeks. So we wanted to make sure that our students were sent home. They were going to have something to do during that time. And as you all know, our school lunch program was um, started right on that Monday the 16th. So that was phase one. Phase two is when we actually started the remote learning plans. Um, so during the last few weeks since um, April 6th, we have been providing students with weekly remote learning plans that were really, really focused on deepening their understanding around skills that were previously taught and also reinforcing some of those, you know, year long skills that we see throughout, um, you know, are really, really essential for the next level. Um, the goal of all of those was really to deepen understanding, to help students develop mastery of those core concepts, and to also help them apply their knowledge to real world application. So not necessarily teaching new instruction during that time. Over the last few weeks, we've engaged with students through Google Meet and Zoom sessions, not providing new content, but instead making sure that they're doing well, checking in, helping them to you know, ask questions, um, We've worked on expanding our tech distribution. Karen and her team have been absolutely incredible getting devices out to those students in three to 12 that didn't, weren't there on the last day or you know, didn't take them home, uh, making sure that students have access. Also been working a lot with families to make sure that they actually have internet access as well. That has been a process. Um, and then the other thing that we've been doing over the last few weeks is making sure that we're connecting with families to measure their level of engagement. Um, we did a survey for families and we're actually in the process of working on a survey for staff um, to see where are the barriers, what are the challenges that you're facing during the remote learning process, and how can we as a district support you to remove those barriers. Um, so that has been the current status of remote learning up until this point. Once uh, the governor announced that we were going to close for the remainder of the year, we've now shifted into phase three. And um, the department has released guidance um, for all schools across the Commonwealth to ramp up remote learning. And really what they've asked us to do is to make sure that we are now starting to introduce new content, new learning for all students. Uh, they developed a list of power standards that are consistent across all districts that they really believe are prerequisite skills for the next grade level. And they have also asked us to really make sure that all students are engaged in, in learning as much as possible. So since we received that guidance from the department, we have spent a lot of time as teams, grade level teams, looking at the standards that we were given, uh, making some judgments about what are the things that we've already taught prior to March 13th? Um, what was the level of mastery that we felt our students had 
on those content standards when they left our classrooms? And where do we need to focus our attention over the next six weeks between now and June 15th? So our grade level team spent a lot of time. They looked at all of that. They have all made plans for the next week, few weeks. What are the standards that are going to be taught explicitly through remote learning? And um, how are we going to be kind of spreading those out? They've also made some judgments on what are the things that we're going to revisit because we felt like it's really important to, for students to have a better, stronger, deeper understanding of those things. Um, so one of the documents that's going out to families tomorrow is an update for families on remote learning. It looks a little bit different. There are now expected assignments that students are going to be asked to do. And we're trying to make sure that we're still giving families flexibility, but it's so important for them to be to, for them to remain engaged, especially as the weather is getting nicer, because we are teaching new content to our students. So um, it's not review. I, I have heard that. It's, it's absolutely not review. It's um, that there are new standards for our students. And we wanted to lay them out for families so they could actually see what are those skills that we're covering over the next few weeks and the importance of remaining engaged. Um, so our teachers have been actually collaborating to develop core instruction. I know there are teachers that are starting to like put themselves out there in a little bit and create a, vi a video of them teaching a lesson or, you know, looking for resources of, you know, things that are already available online. One of the things that we've really, really um, tried to be careful about is the way that we're presenting new instruction for our students. Um, we have heard from families with young children that are trying to manage the, you know, both parents working or perhaps they're working outside the home um, and, you know, managing the devices and trying to get kids on um, to those Zoom calls. We're also hearing from some of our older students that they're taking care of younger siblings during the day. You know, parents might maybe working. Um, and so we're trying to provide them with some flexibility, being able to access that new instruction at a time that works for them. Um, so we're taking an asynchronous approach to new instruction. So students can access it at a time that works for them. Families are able to make their own schedules throughout the day. And the other thing we felt was really important was that students could go back to whatever the new lesson was and, and visit it again if they needed multiple exposures to the new content. So all of our uh, delivery model will be in that asynchronous form. But we've also asked our teachers to kind of ramp up the, the um, live time with students as well. So one of the things that we were asking them to do, and you know, this is all for our joint management group, is we're asking teachers to engage with students in a live format each week. Um, we're still working on what exactly that looks like. Um, but that won't be for live instruction. That'll be for community building, for checking in on students, for helping to clarify their understanding. So um, perhaps going over, you know, the, the skill that was taught earlier in the week, answering questions that students have, helping them actually apply their learning and um, in that live format. So it's, it's not designed to be instruction. It's designed to be remediation, intervention, just a check-in if, if students need that. Really, it's designed for whatever the students need. Um, we're also working to use our PBIS model that we feel is really important in our schools in K-8 to come up with some ideas of how to engage students in a more meaningful way, seeing if we can incentivize participation a little bit. And um, actually, we're, the other thing that we've done and is actually happening tomorrow is we have allowed, not allowed, we've provided our students with their, um, especially at the lower levels, those consumable workbooks that we pay for. Um, so the MyMath and our foundations, Karen and her team are actually distributing iPad minis to families in pre-K to two that have um, voice their concern that they don't have a device or that they're in need of an additional device for their child to be successful in the remote learning plan. So working on getting more materials into students, working on ramping up our remote learning plan. Um, and then after that is phase four and what does re-entry look like, which I think is a challenge for all of us not to really know what the fall holds. Um, but our staff has worked really, really hard to kind of create some sense of normalcy for students um, during a time that is absolutely not normal. So happy to answer any questions that you have. I just wanted to thank uh, Jen, uh, not only you and, and the team, um, 
that have been involved with all of this, so the, the teaching staff, I've attended some of those meetings um, as well, just to, you know, continue to, to push the issue of equity, mastery, and creativity. Um, and the labor management team's also been working to try to have clearer language of, 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 of expectations. Um, are we where we, uh, you know, we, we, we continue, I think, to, to do things um, to the best of our abilities, but uh, I do think that we need to continue to, um, I'll call it ramp up um, in certain areas. Um, in other areas, and we have two students with us tonight, I'd, I'd love to hear from them about um, not specific content or, or teachers, but in general, your thoughts on, and I know you're seeing it's a little different, but what are you hearing from your peers, if, if you wouldn't mind sharing some thoughts? Um, I do know that um, a lot of people that I know are working right now, um, and so that flexible scheduling sounds great, and um, a lot of my teachers have been doing that, um, filming lessons with like notes and their face in the corner explaining it, um, which just allows them to be accessible at any time that is convenient for people, um, which is super helpful. That's been great. Yeah, thankfully most of my teachers have been lenient, but that might be because I'm a senior. Usually I see my sister and she's on her Chromebook a lot and, you know, I assume she's working. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's, I think being lenient would be a probably good plan going forward, especially as we're kind of wrapping up towards the end of the year. Yeah, the, the uh, last week when I was on the call with the student group um, from the high school, it was, it was clear that um, the discussions you guys had is that some teachers did tweet the amount of work, but that some of that still, still needed to be further discussed. Um, but then the other part of it became the idea that, um, as Mr. Searcy says all the time, that you guys are pretty much on a, in some cases, are like a college schedule. You know, you're doing homework at 11 at night or 1 in the morning and all of that just because you might be working during the day or might be too busy in the house during the day to really find a, a quiet spot. So the more flexibility we've had with staff on that, the better. And it seems like the staff is um, at those grade levels is also doing more videoing and all of that so that the students aren't missing a lesson or can go on and, and check a lesson um, at any time that they want or replay a lesson because maybe they didn't understand it the first time. So good to hear. I do have a couple of questions. And then I noticed we also have um, a question in the chat box. Um, you uh, you guys said you were taking your AP exams. Are they all just going to be online? You don't have to go into the school for them, right? They're going to be online, open note. They're cut short. So yeah, it's yeah, uh, it's everybody's going to be taking them at home. Good for you. I know. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> um, my second question, uh, Dr. Bayetta, did we have any long term? subs that we're expecting to do this remote learning right now or how yeah we had we have our building substitutes um and uh well first of all our long long-term subs are active employees that are engaged in those classrooms if they were responsible for so if there was a teacher on a maternity leave and that teacher's still out for example or sick leave that person's still employed by us and still running the classroom if you will like they normally would and then jen do you want to read the chat question or do I how does that work all right so we have a question um, from the audience which is why are the teachers not being held to a standard to actual teach having office hours is not teach I'd like to take that question on um, first of all um, we just completely changed our approach to teaching and learning in the Commonwealth or nationally number one number two um, we don't really know what's ha happening in homes in terms of schedules uh, for some parents having a child um, on their chromebook from eight in the morning until 11 makes sense and for another family it doesn't and we are not defining remote learning as quote teaching in the sense that our teachers are trained to do um, through experience uh, that they've had uh, or through the formal ex experiences that they've had uh, like i did when i went to school um, our goal here is to provide that flexibility. Um, we have a number, we just heard from, for example, high school students. I know from middle school students. I've heard from Yale students because I've gone into the classrooms um, where the families um, have need the flexibility. Um, and so um, that's a key thing, number one. Number two, I have 225 teachers and over 50 support staff that also need the flexibility. 
Why do they need that flexibility? Because they're home with their spouses, with their children, and also trying to provide a experience. Um, there are districts that have kids behind a computer for three hours, followed by another two hours behind a computer of doing homework. Um, we don't have that equity in this district, and I'm talking about one particular district that I know of. So we made a decision that uh, asynchronous approach uh, was the best way. Um, the second part is I was in a classroom uh, this earlier this week um, and actually partook um, in the activity that the students were doing um, with the teacher. And I wouldn't uh, suggest that what happened, um, that students weren't learning, that they weren't engaged. But I could tell you that uh, trying to control, if you will, that classroom remote learning was almost impossible. And this is a veteran teacher that doesn't have any problems with a, uh, the, the uh, classroom management. But students are in one house in their bedroom and another one they're outside and another one they're out behind a desk. So we took this approach from the sense of flexibility as much as possible. I know that answer does not go well with some people. I, I get that. Um, but um, there's, there's another action item on this about the future uh, on the agenda that I'll speak specifically to maybe address uh, the, uh, the Q&A that came up. And Jen, um, maybe this has something to do with phase three that we are, there are actual assignments that are being handed out that will be graded or do you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, so we have the whole time really followed the guidance that was set by the department. Um, in, the in the original remote learning guidelines, we were asked that we really shouldn't be focusing on, focusing on new instruction, but that we should be working on deepening understanding of, skill, of skills and concepts for our students that had already been introduced, and that um, we should be really making sure that learning was not just online learning, that remote learning is, is so much more giving students the opportunity to um, apply their knowledge to real world skills and you know the commissioner used examples such as baking and gardening and all of those things over the last several weeks um, and it looks a little bit different at every level at our primary level they're working on learning menus where students are given um, different activities to choose from throughout the week and we've also started to introduce new skills and concepts during that time um, at the middle school, there there have specific days for specific classes. The assignments are released in the morning um, of those days, and they are you know going through and again beginning to introduce new concepts and, and standards during that time. Um, and I think the high school has been pretty much business as usual for the majority of our students. Um, you know, giving kids a little bit more um, flexibility, of course, but. You know, one of the things that we heard from some of our students is they weren't used to seeing their teachers five days a week because they have a, a rotating schedule and they were getting an awful lot of work at the high school. Um, I, I think it's, it's you know, as Dr. Baez said, it's, it's challenging to know exactly what's happening in all of our homes. Um, at the high school, they are doing a, a modified grading system with their students. Um, and right now what we're looking at in K-8 to is ways to provide family feedback with how students were engaged during this process. Um, the state is recommending a credit or no credit or no grading for some students, um, especially at the lower levels. In K-5, to we offered a, a standards-based report card currently, which is a little bit difficult to assess um, when, you're not, when the students are not in front of you on a daily basis. Um, but we are looking at ways to give parents and students feedback on this process. We're also working really hard with the staff to help them learn new ways to provide students with feedback on a day-to-day -day basis through remote learning. It's it's a little bit different when you're walking around your classroom and you can, you know, kneel down next to someone and, and help support them through a challenging math problem or help them to edit a piece of writing. It's much more difficult when you're sitting on the other side of your computer. But we're, we're helping them, we're supporting them with some, you know, tools that are out there for them to use. Um, you know, I'm a parent, I live in a neighboring community and every community is doing a little bit differently based on the needs of their students and their community. And um, I, I think that everyone is just really try, honestly doing the best that they can. Joe, did you wanna? Thank you. Does anybody... Yeah, there's another question that just came through that actually uh, I'm gonna defer to the next agenda item uh, that speaks to um, folks that wanna speak to me directly about being unhappy about remote learning. And I, I have a, 
an opportunity to, I want to address that question. That's the next agenda item. Okay, so does any, can we wrap this one up? Does anybody have anything else for Mrs. O'Neill? Okay, moving on, um, discussion on formation of subcommittee for planning purposes in the event of a non-traditional opening schools in September. Yes, yeah, so I'll take this up in two phases. The first phase is exactly what you have, which is I'm going to be looking at really three options. The fourth one would be just a traditional uh, uh, opening. One is what I'm calling a staggered opening for September. The other one is uh, is more of a remote learning at the next level, and the other one is online learning. Um, any of those last two could actually, or all three could actually also go into a hybrid or blended learning capacity. Um, and we're working on it now because uh, we really don't know what's going to happen. And I just don't have uh, a multitude of, of folks to be able to uh, um, wink of an eye, if you will, um, just do certain things. And we will be asking for, per, for parental involvement in all three of those. So look for that in the near future. And the idea behind this is to take a look at um, all options that could be on the table for the fall um, and not wait until literally um, the Friday before a Monday, like pretty much happened uh, this year with this. Um, so to the comments on other person making uh, uh, the comments about uh, being disappointed and wanting some input, well, we're going to have an opportunity to do that. I'm announcing tonight two parent town halls. Um, one would be a uh, question and answer. Uh, that's going to be on May 13th at 6.30 in the evening, and uh, we'll post that information, send it out with how you can um, call in and, and ask questions directly of the superintendent. Um, and we'll have some ground rules for those that hopefully everybody can follow. Uh, of course, anyone who uh, wants to reach out with me to an email and then set up a, a private conversation, we're always open to that, of course. The second meeting is on the 20th of May at 6.30 as well. And that's going to be about talking about ideas for the future. And, that, and that's both short-term future and long-term future. So I'm just I'm talking May into June and continuing to take ideas, but also looking at um, the, uh, the fall. Um, I don't want to cause any uh, panic, but we just don't know if the fall is going to be a traditional opening and we need we need the time to figure it out um, and we want folks uh, input on that. Um, the other part that's that's um, important is um, the the way for us to really take a look at this is also oh, has to, uh, if you will, uh, be at the forefront of what are going to be our resources that are going to be available. The Commonwealth has clearly decided, one of the only states in the nation, that it is not going to go out and purchase certain things on behalf of districts. Everything is local control. So what does that mean? Well, that means that uh, some W towns, for example, have been, quote, blended and online more than they've been remote. They can call it remote, but what they're doing is, is they're using a third party curriculum purchase and the teachers are able to view the students work online and then they do the uh, uh, office hours. Um, those are all resources that, to be quite honest, um, we haven't been prepped for. Someone said to me the other day, well, we're doing one to one and three to 12. So why can't? Well, because it's a tool for learning. It's not the way of learning, if you will. Uh, any of us who have taken an online class know that what's happening in online class and remote learning are very different. Um, so the resources that go with that um, are going to be something that's going to be challenging, considering that um, we've now been provided a number that will be the next agenda item um, from the town that's already changed once since last week. It's probably going to change again based on state numbers, um, and uh, that doesn't include if Chapter 70 direct state money doesn't, uh, doesn't come to fruition if you will, um, a 10% cut in state money for us is is a $1.2 million direct hit. That's staggering um, to the school district. So what I'm suggesting is that this is a process that resources and um, av availability of those are um, gonna be difficult for a community like Norton. Uh, be mindful that uh, remote learning in three to 12 or pre-K to 12 or three to 12 having some of the on uh, some of the uh, Google Classroom and Hangouts and all of that are solely because we started school choice five years ago. We would have nothing right now, uh, as the school committee knows, because there has been zero in appropriations um, 
for the for the benefit of the operational budget to do technology. Um, and we are currently working with the uh, um, with the town manager to try to move some money from capital and reorganize our capital. You'll also have this for your meeting next week to change our capital plan so that we can actually purchase for July one or potentially the future um, K one and two technology for every student so they can have one to one um, as well. And then all of those other plans that we're working on, those these three plans and the combination of these three plans for the potential opening of school. And of course, your input as school committee members on that is is uh, wanted as well. I can say too that in the last two weeks, I've been on three Massachusetts school committee calls. Um, one with Senator Markey. Um, the two others, one, the one with Senator Markey had over 100 people on it, the other two had 70 plus. And while there may be some towns around us that might be doing a little bit more as what is seen, um, there are quite a bit more that aren't even close to what we're doing right now. So I mean, it's an unprecedented thing and I think everybody's just trying to, to do their best, but being one-to-one -one make gives us a huge advantage over some of the towns that are just struggling. We have teachers that are, they have teachers that are actually going house to house, handing out packets of papers to people. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I think that, you know, we, there's still work to be done, but I'm, right. I'm certainly proud of what we've done. The other thing too, is I, I'm just reading some of the questions and comments more that are coming back within the screen. And just so I, I did 513 literally because of trying to give people the heads up to be able to come on. Um, but again, just email me directly, use the let's talk and just give me name and cell number and a good time to call you. And I'll, I'll try to work around people's schedules so that I can hear from you directly as always. Um, I can add too. So Kathleen and I were on um, the school committee calls and I do agree, Kathleen, I got the same sense um, that as school committee members um, mm -hmm. in sort of having Senator Markey, who actually was leaving sort of the Senate floor, I guess, or whatever, um, was late to the call as they were making um, different votes for supporting students. Um, there are districts that don't even have um, connection to the internet. So, you know, I, I think that we all um, want what is best. I think that Norton certainly um, is working towards that. And I think we're just a really committed group that are getting input from anybody that wants to share. There's been um, a lot of conversations in Norton about making sure there's a level of equity. I don't know about anybody else, but my internet connect in the past couple of dates has not been great. Um, yeah, I've been we're... kicked off a couple of um, Zoom calls. So I think we're all just really working to um, support children and make sure that you know, socially and emotionally, they're supported. I don't have to tell you, I am sort of, um, I, I've studied child development, putting kids in front of screens, people can say what they want about it, but um, there, there has to be a limit. My daughter luckily was out on the back porch the other day, making some musical instruments using sort of cups and water. And um, so that is, I think, just as important when we are thinking about how we're supporting, educating, um, really developing children's minds. So, but it is true, Kathleen, it was pretty eye-opening when we were on that call with Senator Markey, um, how so many districts are really struggling at this point. Um, you know, Carol, I'm glad you brought this up because, you know, um, just today um, I had an email conversation back and forth with a couple of our administrators, you know, when you look at public education, one of the great things about it is that we teach all kids, right? And you know, I'm, not, I'm not trying to I'm, I'm speak it to the choir and I know that, but what's important about that is, rem, is reminding ourselves that what's happening in one home and another home are totally different. That's number one. Number two, and I think the part that really hits home for me is I'm a firm and always have been that all kids can learn. But I will tell you what's happening right now is social distancing which is the number one thing that we're being asked to do. And the very reason why we're make, doing this call the way that we are and our students are in school and all that, and forget the politics of what you think about it, because that's not part of this discussion. But at the end of the day, um, the conversations I had today was, how do we get so-and-so um, to get more involved? 
And can we do drive-bys and just, you know, see if the student is still engaged? Um, how can we, because uh, they're not communicating back. Uh, these are all frustrations that are in increasing our social, emotional, our mental health, if you will, to use the traditional word um, that, that is known to the public. The mental health of all of us, myself included, I, I, I must have said today at least five times in five different meetings, I currently hate my job. I think it's the first time in my entire life I've ever said that. I hate my job because I like to be in the trenches with my staff and the kids. I don't like it that you know I'm I'm not able to do that, and it it's very bothersome to me to be behind a screen, hours upon hours a day. Uh, I'm feeling it. I'm getting frustrated. I can only imagine not only our parents. Uh, I'm also a parent. Uh, I got moved to the basement. By the way, the funny part of that, uh, I do have a, an office at home, and now I'm in the basement so that my wife can do her uh, uh, remote uh, calls. Um, in the doghouse. Well, I've been in that one too. Um, uh, um, but at the end of the day, th this has been such a learning curve for all of us, not only as parents, not only as educators, as school committee members, or whatever our roles have been. And what we've learned from it is that um, as much as I think we have been bashing the idea that technology has taken us away from being able to communicate appropriately, or to be able to look people in the eye or any of that. Could you imagine if we didn't have Zooming or Google Hangout right now? I mean, I'm 51 years old. I was talking to a friend last night about how, imagine if this had happened back in my day. Well, in my day, you were out playing until eight o'clock at night. You got home at three and you went out playing until eight o'clock at night. Kids don't do that now. All we're doing is driving them around to every unique situation that you can. So when I look at, at, at the dynamics of all of, the, of, all of this, we know that the social emotional well-being of children and staff and adults, I should say, is going to be a major hurdle for every school system over the next, I would say, easy three to five years, if not longer. Okay, does anybody have anything else to add? Okay, moving on, um, the budget update. Well, my favorite part. Um, well, um, Matt is reworking the budget. Reworking is magic. Um, we are trying to figure out ways um, with a new number that we've received from the town. I'm going in front of FinCom, by the way, on Monday night. Um, so join in if you can. Um, we're recreating the budget and then gonna prepare recommendations for you to consider. Uh, Mike Units has provided us some numbers. Those numbers have changed. Um, to his defense, uh, the state numbers changed. He's trying to use some of that number, some of those numbers. On the other side of it, um, we don't we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, Mike, uh, not to speak for him, but he's he's recommending that we try to get a, a, a town meeting, uh, an election on the twentieth, I believe it is, and a town meeting on the twenty fifth. But that's up to the board of selectmen to decide. Um, and coming up with a uh, uh, the best. Uh, option and getting the school committee, the board of selectmen, the FinCom to basically have a, a potential for a, a one question town town meeting so that we can set our budget and then take care of other items in the fall. By then we'll have better numbers anyways. That has a direct impact on us anyways. If it's the 25th, I have to make decisions prior to May 15th, uh, excuse me, June 15th. Um, so I, I will, will do that. Um, and some of that, um, um, hinders um, on what the final numbers become. Right now, the cuts that uh, are being recommended in terms of the total numbers from the town are based upon a 10% cut to local receipts and all of that stuff. Um, we still really don't have what that number is going to be at the end of the day. I'm hoping that we have more information on Monday um, and we can continue to crunch our numbers. We're getting about uh, smack, correct me if I'm wrong, 760 or so, 760,000 or so. 748. Okay, great. Even less than I thought. Um, so we'll know we'll know what that number means, um, and also um, what the commitment is um, to the unions in terms of uh, contract increases. And that issue is being handled by um, Carolyn and Denez as your representatives. Okay. Anybody have any questions about that? 
Okay, one thing I just have to toot a little bit of a horn because I hope Miss Holly is still on this call because um, this little guy just finished UMass Amherst Eisenberg. I guess it's official now because You just muted yourself. You just muted yourself. Not that we have anything to do with it with because it should have been Friday, but at least we we got a tap we got a uh, cord. That's about it. So congratulations to any college graduation that is not happening. We're we're still proud of you guys. The class of 2020 is certainly unique. All right. Is there any other business? I actually would like yes. to uh mention something. Um, I think that we should have a joint meeting as soon as possible with um, ourselves, Board of Selectmen and FinCom, if we can set something like that up to do a call. I think that there's a lot of um, chatter going back and forth about the food services and, and what we're providing to families in need during this difficult time with the breakfast and lunch program. Um, I think there's maybe not a lot of information being shared um, with the other departments, uh, no fault of ours. I think it's important to get us all on a call to address this before things really start to spiral on that. Okay, well, I'll, um, I'll move forward to, um, and um, putting that to the, um, if the committee wishes me to, um, I don't need a vote. But if that's what the committee is, is looking for me to do, I'll email that to the powers that be tomorrow. Is there, I don't know if anybody else has any other thoughts on it, but I just, things that I'm hearing, I just think it needs to be addressed. Yeah, I would agree. I think we need to make this kind of stuff in the bud. So let's, let's get together and talk it up. Yeah, I think it's important to keep the communication open. I mean, we haven't, I haven't heard too much from the town as a whole, at least me personally. So uh, that's irregardless of the budget season and all that. But I think we need um, to open up that communication again and get everybody together. I think it's definitely a good idea, Sherry. You muted, Kathleen. Yeah, I know. No. I can't. My button. I have two other issues when you can. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously we have to have some kind of meeting because the from what we've seen of emails going back and forth, they're still not asking us the questions to ask us as opposed to asking amongst each other. So I, I think that the call at least has to happen. Um, and you said you had something else, Dr. Bayer? Yeah, just two items. Um, one is tomorrow I'm meeting with the high school administration, and this is really for the for the two seniors. We're going to start um, recommending and making action on class of 2020 activities, uh, scholarship night, and all of that stuff. Uh, graduation is a big one that we have to try to resolve. Um, so I just wanted to put that out. We have recommendations coming from them for my consideration. Um, I am going to ask for an executive session next week of the school committee because there are a number of uh, negotiated items that you need to know about and that's a reason to go into executive session. So we'll do a regular meeting and then move into executive session um, of the school committee. And then lastly, a happy Mother's Day to all of you that are mothers and all the moms out there this weekend. Thank you, yes, happy Mother's Day to all. Does anybody have anything else to add? Okay, we need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Okay, all those in favor, aye. Kathleen Stern, Dan. Dan Sheedy, aye. Dinez. Dinez, Dinez, aye. Sherry. Sherry Cohen, aye. And Carolyn. Carolyn Gallagher, aye. Okay, good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Happy Mother's Day.